Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. We're so excited to have on the podcast this week, Dr. Ian McGilchrist. Dr. Ian McGilchrist is a psychiatrist, neuroscience researcher, philosopher, and literary scholar. He is a quantum fellow of All Souls College, Oxford, an associate fellow of Green Templeton College, Oxford, a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and former consultant psychiatrist and clinical director at the Bethlehem Royal and Maudsley Hospital, London. He has been a research fellow in neuroimaging at Johns Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore, and a fellow of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Stellenbosch. He has published original articles and research papers in a wide range of publications on topics in literature, philosophy, medicine, and psychiatry. He is the author of a number of books, but is best known for his internationally acclaimed The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, published by Yale in 2009. His most recent book, The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World, has just been published. He lives on the Isle of Skye, has two daughters and a son, and now grandchildren. So, Dr. McGilchrist, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We're delighted to have you. And I wonder if we can get started with you just giving us a summary of your basic thesis for those who may not be familiar with it. Well, in the book, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, I did something which was rather bucking the trend in neuroscience, which was to take seriously the idea that our two brain hemispheres are different. In a way, it's bizarre that anyone would imagine they weren't. Why would the brain that's all about making connections have a whopping great divide down the middle? Why is it fundamentally asymmetrical? And indeed, why are the neural networks of other animals we've looked at, however primitive and ancient, asymmetrical? And why is the corpus callosum, the body of fibers at the base of the brain that connects the two hemispheres, often inhibitory? It's telling the other hemisphere, it communicates information positively, but a lot of its action is to inhibit the intrusion of the other hemisphere. So the idea that there's no difference is bizarre. And, it, and that really came out of the pop psychology thing that, you know, the left hemisphere was rational and linguistic and the right hemisphere was emotional and pictorial, um, which you can pretty much uh, entirely forget. In fact, any readers who still think like that just put that out of your mind. <laughs> it's all wrong. Um, so I, I, I began to investigate, well, I took 20 to 30 years investigating differences between the brain hemispheres. And there's a 
there's a mass of information about this. Um, some of it drawn from people who have had strokes or from the study of so-called split brain patients who'd had the, the two halves of the brain surgically divided, a treatment for intractable epilepsy, uh, and so on. And nowadays, of course, there's evidence from uh, studies in which you can temporarily suppress one hemisphere or the other and see what happens to the person. And what I found was that the differences were not to do with what they did in the sense of reason, language, etc., but were to do with how they approached everything. Each hemisphere dealt with everything. In that sense, the old um, stories were all wrong. But that didn't mean there were no differences. The differences were in the manner of approach. And that brought me to the question of attention, because attention is how we dispose our consciousness towards the world. And that is a matter that we can choose. We can choose to dispose our attention in a certain way. And depending on how we dispose it, we find a different world. From an evolutionary point of view, I believe this separation, which as I say, exists in every known neural network, right down to the simplest possible creatures that have any kind of a neural network. The basis for this is an evolutionary need to do two things at once to dispose your attention in two entirely different ways, two opposite ways to the world at exactly the same time. One is a narrow, highly focused, detail-orientated attention to something already prioritized by you um, in order to get it. So in order to get food, to pick up a seed, to catch a rabbit, to pick up a twig to build a nest, to to manipulate the environment for your own good, you need a certain kind of very limited, very narrow, highly targeted, fragmentary attention to a detail. But if that's the only attention you pay, the whole of the rest of the world has gone missing. And that's extremely dangerous because it contains your kin, it contains your enemies, and you could become somebody else's lunch while you're getting your own. So in order, <laughs> in order to survive, you need to pay two completely different kinds of attention to the world at once. Narrow, detail, specific, already spoken for, and another entirely uncommitted, open, broad, sustained, vigilant attention to the whole of the rest. And in the soundbite, I say the left hemisphere is designed to help us manipulate the world, the, the right hemisphere to enable us to understand it. Now, just to uh, very briefly and very crudely outline the consequences of this, as I say, attention changes the world. If you attend to something in one way, you see one thing. If you attend to it in another, you see another. And if you attend with this left hemisphere's fragmentary attention, you find the world is full of things that are already familiar, known, certain, fixed, isolated, abstracted from context, disembodied, general in nature, and quantifiable, um, and roughly speaking, inanimate. In fact, the left hemisphere is particularly attracted to inanimacy, to tools, and to machines. The right hemisphere, meanwhile, sees that nothing is entirely known fully, uh, is never entirely certain fully, is never entirely separate fully, is connected broadly to everything else, that it's never fixed and sliced. It's always part of a seamless flow. It is never understood outside its context because the context makes it what it is. It is always embodied. It is always unique, not just an instance in a left hemisphere category. And this results in a world of moving, living, interconnected, dynamic, always evolving, always coming further into our understanding, a network of living beings. And so uh, these are really two quite different pictures of the world. My thesis is, in The Master and His Emissary, that for reasons that I could go into if you particularly wanted, but that generally speaking, there has been a tendency in civilizations for this articulate left hemisphere to take over 
the discord and for civilizations to embrace more and more this left hemisphere's view of the world, which makes you powerful, enables you to grab stuff. It's very easy to articulate compared with the ability to understand all that is implicit and ramifies endlessly. It's a, it's a piece of cake. So it tends to be the one that um, we listen to and that it, it inevitably leads to the, the decline, the coarsening of human awareness, the dampening or loss of the human spirit and to a collapse of civilization. And in the very second part of the Master and His Emissary, I, I think I've seen this, I can trace it, a rise of both the right and left hemisphere together, producing wonderful richness all across the entire field of art and science and philosophy and society. In the 6th century BC, in the Greek world, um, in around the year dot in the Roman world, and in the Renaissance in our own time, but that in each case there has been a shift towards the left which resulted in the destruction of those civilizations, and that I feel that since the Enlightenment, um, which was a wonderful movement, but has been uh, turned into a, an all-or-nothing um, exaggerated caricature of itself, a very hubristic one, uh, since then, um, we, we've reached a point where we are actually destroying ourselves. I suppose that's the elevator. It's a quite a long elevator. Imagine we're going up the Empire State Building, but that's the elevator pitch on, it's, on that. <laughs> it uh, was a wonderfully helpful uh, summary, and, and it really makes clear the stakes. I mean, what, what you're putting your finger on is so enormous, isn't it? Yes. Linking it to, to our particular interest in Jung, you have all of this science in the Master and His Emissary that you were speaking about and, and talk about two ways of tending to the world. It's almost like there are two different personalities. Uh, one thing that I was really struck by, you say this uh, in a couple places, is that the right hemisphere corresponds loosely, not perfectly, but loosely to what Jung might have called the unconscious. And the left hemisphere corresponds more or less to consciousness. So I'm, I'm wondering if you agree with that, if there's anything you would like to elaborate on about that? I mean, first of all, and very obviously, the right hemisphere is conscious. So that if you had your left hemisphere removed or a vast left hemisphere stroke that destroyed the entire left hemisphere, you wouldn't be unconscious. You'd be fully conscious. So it, it sustains consciousness along with the left hemisphere. But the conscious and unconscious are not, as they're often seen, as possibly too why not, possibly symmetrical or possibly equal realms, often seen as like two tanks, one on top of the other, you know, and occasionally a fish pops up through a trap hole from the tank below the mm -hmm. yeah. into the conscious. Yeah. The, the image I t tend to use, because the unconscious is vast, is, 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 is absolutely vast compared with the, with the conscious. Again, Neuroscience is, is able now more to quantify the extent of the unconscious. And one particular paper amuses me by its specificity. It says that 99.44% of all brain activity is unconscious, which is <laughs> you don't have to buy the precision to get the general <laughs> idea. Very That's little, great. That's very great. little needs to be in consciousness. I suppose what I would say is that the left hemisphere is that spotlight that I describe, where you turn the full focus of your awareness, the awareness that you're aware of using, your self-aware awareness, onto something. Again, it's like a spotlight in that in the great stage on which the opera or the drama is being unfolded, the spotlight will be on only one place, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the stage doesn't exist or the rest of the cast don't exist. Just for the moment, they're not in the spotlight. And the spotlight can move. It can move somewhere else, and something that was unconscious becomes conscious. 
equally things of which you were conscious five minutes ago, you're no longer conscious of. So things are coming and going between consciousness and unconsciousness. Very, very, very importantly, the unconscious is not in any sense inferior to the conscious, quite the opposite. The conscious is a very important tool that can at times be critical to be able to bring the consciousness to bear on a certain kind of problem is sometimes absolutely vital. And we do a lot of things with our consciousness, but we also do the majority of even the most sophisticated things with our unconscious. So, for example, mathematicians often gain their insights entirely unconsciously. Scientists make discoveries intuitively and unconsciously. They may do a lot of hard conscious work, but they, the answers usually come unconsciously. In, in life, you and I make complex decisions, solve problems, calibrate needs, um, fall in love, uh, find things beautiful and attractive or don't, make decisions that will alter the course of our life, often mulling things over entirely unconsciously. And there's a good reason, because the unconscious can take in a very, very large number of strands of meaning and information and knowledge and experience from memory, whereas consciousness is limited to what these words will say now, which is, you know, a tiny part. It may be that sometimes it's very, very important to be clear about that part, but then you should retire from that and allow that work to be taken back into the bigger picture. A.N. Whitehead, a philosopher of whom I'm um, an enormous admirer, says that, that episodes of consciousness are like cavalry charges in battle. Very, <laughs> they're very expensive. They, can, they require fresh horses, and they should only be done at moments of extreme need. So, uh, <laughs> and, and as people get better at things, more and more goes into the unconscious. Indeed, he said that a civilization advances by the number of operations that it can do unconsciously. So oh, that's example, interesting. When you're learning medicine, you have to think through everything as a medical student, terribly consciously with checklists. When you're learning chess, you have to think, now, if I do that, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're a great pilot, a great surgeon, a great chess player, whatever, most of what you do, you do entirely unconsciously, intuitively. And it wouldn't be better if you did it consciously. You wouldn't be so good. Yeah, this this makes me think about uh, what you call, I think, reintegration. And I, I may make a muddle of this so you can uh, <laughs> correct me or, or flesh it out. But that we start off with a sort of implicit grasp of something. And then we kind of give it to the left. So that's the right hemisphere. And then we sort of give it to the left hemisphere to unpack it and make it explicit. And then it has to be given back to the right hemisphere so that there's this sort of new wholeness of appreciation. Absolutely right. Yes. Yes. So, so for example, you were saying when you're a chess player or a surgeon, if you're learning a piece of music, you might begin with, with a, a, a just sort of wonderful appreciation of the music, listening to it. But then to learn it, you're going to really depend on your left hemisphere to read the music. I mean, especially the way I read music, it's pretty laborious. But maybe eventually it becomes in your fingers and you don't have to think about it anymore. And then you can play it, hopefully, with artistry and emotion. And that would be that, that new sense of wholeness. Yes. And one of the things that I think about with that is, and I think about this all the time, is how much that relates to the process of what we do in analysis. Because I think people come into analysis with uh, an intuitive sense and a kind of an implicit sense maybe of, of a feeling that something's wrong let's say, something's bothering them. And they can feel it. It might be in their body. It's in their whole gestalt, but they don't, they can't name it. Mm. And that part of the task of analysis is to make that thing that's implicit, to make it explicit, to find the language of it, and then share it together in this uh, kind of affective way that resonates between the two of us. So, 
this feeling that they came in the door with doesn't just become something that they know intellectually because I've given it words, but that together we've worked to make it explicit, but but also alive in a new way between us. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, uh, that's a very fine idea. Um, and I'm sure that is right about how it must work. Too often, I think, in the modern world, we think that when we've got to the stage of analyzing and clarifying, we've reached the goal. But actually, that is an intermediate step, um, much like the taking a part of the piece of music and the practicing of bar 18 over and over and over again and understanding the harmonic progression theoretically is, is a great way <laughs> of helping you come to a yeah. fuller understanding. But when you give that final performance, that must not obtrude at all. Um, doesn't mean it was wasted time. It was very valuable time, but it, it must be taken up again. And I think that is what you've just said about therapy. Is, is great because, of course, I would have thought of Jung as being a great exponent of the power of metaphor, myth, narrative, and all the aspects of language which actually are highly dependent, literally, on the right hemisphere. So the left hemisphere, you know, has an extensive dictionary, and it has um, some very clear rules of syntax which enable it rather like a a very well-programmed computer to construct sentences that make some kind of sense. But the various aspects of language are served mainly by the right hemisphere. There are things like tone of voice, uh, facial expression, body language, which are all extraordinarily important in all three of those, I think, in, in therapy. Metaphor, narrative, and myth which uh, seems also very important um, and which give meaning to what otherwise seem like rather simple, explicit declarations. And this is not just something peculiar about a certain kind of perhaps unscientific understanding, because science itself requires myths and metaphors. Science is highly dependent on myths and metaphors. And scientists who don't realize that it is are so wedded to the myth of the machine and the the narrative of scientific progress and so on that they don't see that really their vision is governed by these things. What what I particularly like is that Niels Bohr said that, you know, there is no way in which you can understand uh, quantum mechanics except by using the language of poetry. So Hmm. language is... Language has its sort of left hemisphere aspect, but then these need to be taken back into a realm which makes sense overall. The right hemisphere is the the locus of what in linguistics is called pragmatics, which is the way in which an utterance is understood as a whole in context, which is quite different from just an analytic proposition. Uh-huh. I am curious about all of the, you know, sort of implicit uh, stuff in what you're saying about relationship, whether it's the relationship between me and me, or you and you, or as Lisa is saying, um, in the comparison to psychoanalysis, the relationship between the analysand and the analyst. And uh, all of this area of feeling, embodiment, and what goes on between, uh, that there, there is this betweenness uh, where the aliveness is. I, I think I'm just thinking about, you know, that it's right hemisphere, left hemisphere, you know, one or the other. And, and actually, it's just this, what you've said, it's a flow and it's a dynamic. And, and it has to take place between people and in the world, as well as internally. Yes, very important. I mean, my favorite philosopher of all time, Heraclitus, um, is fable to everything flows. And, of course, it's there in the essence of Taoism, which is another philosophy that I I greatly admire. But I do think um, and argue in this book that relationships are primary, which is partly why the title is The Matter with Things, it works on a number of levels that obviously we have a problem. <laughs> There's a matter with things. But also that 
part of that is that we are obsessed with the material uh, world. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the material world, it's very no. real, but that we can find the spiritual and must find the spiritual in and through it rather than by rejection of it. And that um, everything is relational. So, I, I mean, really, everything is relational. And if you go to the core concepts in all cultures of the sacred or the divine origin, whatever that is, it is relational. I mean, the idea that God is love, well, love is the ultimate relationship, basically. But this is true also of words in, in, other, in other traditions, li, rata. The original logos was not just a word, but was a kind of power that connected things. So all these ideas come from the notion of connectedness, out of which everything else um, emerges. And I argue that relationships exist prior to relata. In other words, the things that are related don't exist and then get to be related. They emerge out of the relationship. They only become what they are because of the relationship. And so to try to understand them prior to the relationship is, is nonsense. To return to what you were saying, is I, I invented this concept between us, which is often misunderstood to mean a sort of rapport or, or, or empathy or something, which is part of it, of course. But what I was really saying is something more ontological, that when things come into connection, there's not just the thing and the other thing that were connected and now the connection between them. <laughs> Uh, for one thing, temporarily, that's to put things back to front, as I've just explained. But it's like an electric circuit. Where is the electricity? Is it in the positive pole? No. Is it in the negative pole? No. Is it in the positive and negative pole together? Not really. Is it in the space between them? No, not there either. It's in the positive pole, the negative pole, the space between them, and whatever it is that comes into being when you put the whole thing together, which is something new um, and yeah. cannot be accounted for by any of the parts. So this brings us to the concept again of the Gestalt, because the definition in a way of a Gestalt is a whole form that simply cannot be accounted for in terms of its parts. The, the analyst and the analysand, and for the person and the parts of the psyche, they can't be seen in isolation from one another or even focused on and then put together, but something emerges out of the whole experience. Yeah. And in analysis, we call that the analytic third, that you and me or any two people or your analogy to electricity is also used in Jungian thought of holding the tension of the opposites and and allowing this third thing that that you cannot think of ahead of time uh to emerge yeah. and it's it's in a way it's wonderful and it it happens all the time yes um and it's very mysterious if you really think about it it's it's very deep and very magical very mysterious and we all recognize it when it happens it's important it makes all the difference that it's not one thing or the other. It's something new. That's lovely. And I, I like the word new because it is creative. It is something that wasn't there, but now has come into being. And, and in, in some senses, this is not at all different. Um, an idea I don't talk about so much in the new book, but did in the Master and His Emissary of Hegel's idea of the of the, the Aufhebung of a thing and its, and its other, that when they're brought together, they become the qualities that were in the original two things are taken up into something new and make something new in this third one thing. So uh, uh, this idea is a very basic one, it seems to me. It's, it's there in, 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 in all aspects of philosophy and physics now. And uh, I, I think Jung was a wonderfully intuitive mind who, who, who saw things ahead of his time. And his correspondence with Pauli, it was a very important thing for him and for Pauli. And I think they, they saw in one another's minds and in their, they saw 
infinite reflections that magnified their in thinking together. You know, and I think that Jung intuited something of the same thing that you're intuiting, that the loss of that perspective, or maybe not the loss of it, but the devaluing of it in the modern world was a cause of serious soul sickness that was going to have widespread consequences for individuals as well as cultures. And I I feel like you know, one of his missions was in some sense to call our attention to this loss and to try to restore it. And he too was trying to bridge the scientific aspect. You know, he was trained as a medical doctor and he would often couch things in very scientific terms to to try to sort of speak to a certain audience. But really underneath, I think he was he was informed by I want to call it almost a kind of um, mystical access or, or, or a mystical outlook or something that brought in the non-rational, the implicit, the the myth, the metaphor, and desperately saw the importance of restoring that, both in, in the sense of, uh, you know, for the health, for the mental health of his patients, you know, he said that the the main source of uh, a sickness was a, a loss of connection to the instincts and an absence of meaning. You know, so this is this is the meaning doesn't come from the left hemisphere. It we not. need the the yeah. right hemisphere uh, to, to do that. Absolutely, and that that and that is where I quite agree that that right hemisphere includes certainly a lot of the unconscious, but also what the body tells us. The right hemisphere is simply more in touch with the body. And the body is, as has been said by philosophers such as Schopenhauer, there is more wisdom in our bodies than there is in our heads. I mean, and there was a, a hard-headed philosopher, if you like. <laughs> um, that, that aspect is very important. You know, our bodies are rich with information that they are giving to us. I, I often mention the fact that there are more neurons in the human gut than there are in a dog's brain, and a dog is a very intelligent animal. Um, wow. So, and our heart also is uh, not just taking instructions from the brain, but is sending back messages to the brain. Uh, in medical school, this was a bit of an embarrassment. What were they for? They must be pain fibers. Well, there are pain fibers, but there's a hell of a lot more going on there just as the neurons in the gut are not, not all about enabling you to have peristalsis. You could get mm. more, <laughs> rather fewer. So our bodies are constantly involved in everything we do. Our emotions, our intellect, and our bodies are, are seamlessly interconnected. And when you start to try and rigidly cut them apart, as many great philosophers have pointed out, you end up diminishing the power of your ability to understand, to intuit, and to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing less intelligent about this kind of knowledge. And there's nothing irrational, by the way, about, um, you know, I just want to say this because it's easy to go from Jung, so mystical, magical, and so on. But Jung also, uh, uh, like me, I hope, <laughs> was a great respecter of science and a great respecter of reason. It falls to someone like myself who actually believes that at the moment our science is not scientific enough, it's too dogmatic, and that our reason is not reasonable enough, it's too dogmatic, mm -hmm. and, and who wants to defend science and reason <laughs> against their critics to point out that they can't do everything. And there are things mm -hmm. Many, many things that lie beyond them, not against them, not in yes. defiance of them, but that are, as I say, not irrational, but transrational or supernational. Mm. They That's simply, nice. they, they, they are there in some way that we know has meaning, but we cannot deal with it purely through an account that is science or reason. For example, the greatness of a piece of music that has a powerful impact on you as great as anything you've ever read or experienced. For me, at the moment, it, it, it would be um, Schubert's last great work, his C major quintet, which mm -hmm. is so unutterably powerful that I defy anyone to listen to it and say that it doesn't mean something to, 
And yet yeah. this meaning is simply, it's not irrational, it's just completely beyond reason and beyond science to decode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking about um, what you had said before, Lisa, the analogy to music and and appreciating it and then having to learn how to play finger by finger and scale by scale and then reintegrating it so you can play with feeling and artistry. And now you're making a similar comparison to Schubert. And uh, that I'm so appreciating your work because it seems to me analogous to taking what great philosophers, wisdom figures, and certainly Jung uh, knew intuitively, and you're taking that step of making it explicit to all of us so that we can understand it through our perhaps, you know, overdeveloped or fragmented uh, sense of reason and our need to make models of the world, of your offering it to us in this way. Uh, And I think the next step is how do we take it back into a more holistic, uh, felt, integrated, lived understanding? Well, that's that's one of the things I'm I'm glad you said that, Deb, because I was thinking about that this morning. Actually, getting getting ready for this is that I think your your work in some way does offer that reintegration because it has all the science, and then it's got all this beautiful mm-hmm. philosophy, <laughs> and then you write so beautifully that it itself is an example of this process of reintegration. I think so, and it's to us now. Yes, uh, to do that in ourselves, and you say at some point, if you if you like what these ideas uh, st- strike a chord in you, to go back to the music metaphor, of uh, take it forward, take it out into the world. I think I think that's right, and um, I don't think either Jung or, or I. <laughs> I feel very hubristic. <laughs> no, that's okay. But, Go for it. <laughs> no, but I mean, both of us being psychiatrists, I don't think we would say to people, this is a recipe, you say, this is what you do. But what we're trained to do is to help people see things, and both the things that are, they're embracing now that are not helping them, and the things that they could embrace that may help them. On Tuesday, uh, so where are we today? Monday, so nearly a week ago, I had a conversation in London in front of a large audience with Philip Pullman, the novelist. Oh, Mm -hmm. yes. uh, It really was a lovely occasion, but um, he began by saying that when he read The Master and His Emissary, he felt as though all sorts of things that he knew intuitively to be the case, but had never had words to articulate or any way really of putting them across were being explained, validated and put forward in a way that made complete sense in terms of a whole picture. And so many people have written to me to say words of the same Mm -hmm. kind. So Mm -hmm. what I hope I'm doing is like a good psychiatrist, as it were, not putting something alien into somebody's mind, but actually saying, this is thing this is something anciently you know yes it is, it is real and it is true and i can show you the evidence that it is real it is true it is intelligent it is not dangerous it is not negligible it is not irrational it is powerfully important for your well-being and for the well-being of our society so that is what i try to do really and then as i say to people each of you that, that as it were gets it and so many people do write to me and just mm-hmm. say, yeah Thank definitely you. you've changed my life i mean this is yes I, i'm not saying this to to sort of you know say how marvelous or something except in the sense of how marvelous for me to have correspondents constantly saying you changed my life you know for anyone to have somebody come up to you once in your life and say, your work changed my life is a great gift. And I have this all the time. So I, I should be and, and hope to be appropriately grateful to them. But that's what I aim to do is to help people see things a new way or better a way that they kind of intuitively know is there 
will take them to a landscape yep. that they remember almost as in a dream. This is the real world, and I've been separated from it. And, of course, mm-hmm. that now also shows us the very, very clear data that things that in the past we would have asserted intuitively are the case, that cutting yourself off from socially cohesive life, cutting yourself off from nature, and cutting yourself off from a spiritual source, all three of these things, these are the three main determinants of human happiness and of social well-being for the person. Mm -hmm. And for society. Societies wow. thrive, people thrive when they observe this closeness in terms of social cohesion rather than fragmentation and aggression, when they have this sense of closeness to nature rather than using it and destroying it and uglifying it, and when they have this sense of a spiritual something that is deep inside us that we honor. And mm. the evidence is that 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 has every kind of positive effect. At the simplest and most utilitarian level, it improves physical health. All three of them are better than stopping smoking, losing weight, and going to... (laughs) If you you really need a utilitarian... Yeah, right. They also um, improve cognitive function. They improve Mm -hmm. mood. They make people happier. They make people less anxious. They make people feel more fulfilled. They make people feel that there is a purpose and a point in their lives again. Uh, And they make the world, the social world, the civilization we belong to, a better place to thrive in. So, good God, it's so Mm -hmm. important. It's so straightforward, really. I mean, that's the summary of a very, very long book. (laughs) And it goes to, you know, what Jung said of how do you change the world? One person at a time. Yeah. I like and that. Yeah. It, each of us has a huge ripple effect. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't know how big. Left hemisphere is going, you're very small. The cosmos is very big. You probably don't have any impact. But actually the right hemisphere is saying, but how does one weigh love? Mm. How does one <laughs> weigh spirit one doesn't know what one person may do with their life and in fact in practical terms we see that occasionally um one or even a handful of people can make the world move so yeah i want to introduce one more topic before we finish because it's of particular interest to us and that is uh, about dreaming and can you tell us anything about dreaming and lateralization? Do we do we know is do dreams kind of come from one hemisphere uh, versus another? Do we do we know much about this? It's a difficult one because when we're dreaming, both hemispheres are involved and are dreaming. However, in the waking state, there is a something like one point two to one preponderance of activity in the left hemisphere over the right, which is interesting because the right hemisphere is the master, the one that really understands far more, is more intelligent, more insightful, more perceptive, more attentive. But in most of our practical daily stuff, there is a kind of, uh, on an EEG, there is a, a slight asymmetry towards activity in the left hemisphere. In dreaming, that seems to be abolished, but it's not just that it goes on in the right hemisphere. But what seems to happen is that, if you like, end up trapped in in the left hemisphere, have access to and are taken up by the right hemisphere in ways that can illuminate them or change them. It's not at all straightforward, though. It really isn't. And... I mentioned earlier my colleague John Cutting, who who is uh, I have to acknowledge, you know, was a great inspiration to me at an early phase in my in my journey through this territory about hemisphere difference. But uh, he argues that dreaming is a primarily left hemisphere phenomenon. Now I don't actually agree with him about that, and I think I quote in the new book evidence that probably 
more important parts of dreaming are right hemisphere, but it definitely involves both. But it, it just is a different way of accessing the world in which images and shapes and forms and feelings are suddenly relatively validated by comparison with words and ideas. In ordinary waking, words and ideas, important as they are, tend to tyrannize, to, to sort of have thought to themselves. And what dreaming enables one to do is to take all of that much, much further into a more symbolic realm. On the lateralization issue, I'm, I'm probably not very helpful, but, but I do think that dreaming is very, very important. Well, of course, we think about dreams as the unconscious trying to alert consciousness to something. It's it's like a conversation, and it's it's a it's a conversation with a part of us that doesn't have access to language in the same way. So it uses this imagistic, metaphorical language to convey things. Yes. I watched um, some YouTube videos of some of Gazaniga's experiments with split brain patients where he would flash a word to someone, you know, who'd had a, a, a cut corpus callosum and, and the right hemisphere would see it, but wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to find a word for it, sure. but then could draw it. Yes. And then, and then the person would look at it and say with the left hemisphere, oh, it's a telephone. Yes. And I thought, well, th that's sort of like a dream where our unconscious throws up these images and then consciousness can go, okay, wait a minute. What, yes. what is it saying to me? Yes, I mean, those, those experiments of Kazani sort of split brain are important. Again, I report them in the books, but I, I think possibly for, for another reason that they're important. But, but the, I'm not sure they're an exact analogy of dreaming, but, but I do think you're, you're absolutely right that it, it enables the unconscious mind to work on things and to bring things forward and of course, Jung himself had premonitory dreams, didn't he, about the war? And I don't know whether I have premonitory dreams. I do have rather rare, um, unpleasant dreams. Most of my dreams are to do with exploring um, buildings, actually, on the whole. Very beautiful buildings, the like of which I've never seen in the, in the real world. But recently, I've had several dreams that involved being in a building where floodwaters are rising outside the building. One of them was being obviously in a university room with, with high windows, and it was in a town. But outside, I could see stream water flowing past the window to halfway up these high windows. And I was thinking, this will surely burst into this room very soon. <laughs> but then I had mm. a dream about being on an, a house on an island and the water was passing on either side of this house. And then it started to fill the house from the bottom up. You know, mm. I, I see these as premonitory dreams about, well, um, either a literal or a metaphorical tide of water that will be overwhelming us soon. Mm -hmm. That's um, sobering. Mm. I'm also appreciating that uh, dreams cannot be just uh, localized in this is how it works in the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, and this is what happens, that there's still mystery here. Mm -hmm. And we often refer to the dream maker as a way of uh, saluting and, and giving a bow to this mysterious force that acts in us and through us if we will, you know, make it a point to attend to those messages of direct our waking left brain toward what has happened in our dreaming mind. It's the difficulty of articulating it goes as far as something I find very interesting, which is I think I can say that I've experienced emotions in dreams that I've not experienced in waking life. I think the, the repertoire of emotions that I'm consciously aware of experiencing it doesn't exhaust all the emotions. Mm -hmm. I think in, in certain dreams, I have actually experienced emotions that simply there aren't yes. words for them. Mm -hmm. And that interests me too, because I think, again, in music, that 
the particular the particularity, the quiddity, the just so-ness of a certain piece of music can produce an emotion which actually only that piece of music can produce. Yeah. And when your left hemisphere sets to work to describe it, it reduces it to, oh, it's that, or it has like half a dozen categories of possible emotions <laughs> that you could experience. But it seems to me that there's an almost infinite array of emotions that are experienced in listening to music, which only seem to be members of categories after the left hemisphere has got hold of them and tried to compartmentalize them. So that is another way of validating the idea mm -hmm. because the left hemisphere always sees things in terms of the categories they belong to, whereas the left hemisphere sees the unique case. I mean, literally sees uniqueness without having collapsed it into a generality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I I think I think that's just right. That that dreams have that kind of wealth of emotional experience and nuance, and and music does too. Yeah, we have real lived experiences and feelings in dreams. They make us more. They make us bigger. Well, I, we don't want to keep you too long, but I did want to uh, leave some space for you to talk about your new book. Ooh. I've just started it. Uh, but can you can you tell us it it just um, it just became available a few days ago, correct? Yes, it's it's called the the matter with things, and it's subtitled our brains, our delusions, and the unmaking of the world, which I believe we're engaged in doing as fast as we possibly can. And I'm afraid on Amazon in America you can still only get the Kindle, and while the Kindle is less expensive, I appreciate that. For anyone who's a serious student, I really would recommend the book because I have taken pains for it to be a beautiful thing to read, not crowded mm. on the page as the master and his emissary was, but with margins, with the notes in the margins, so that even on a Kindle you have to click and wait several seconds for something to come up and it rather disrupts the thread. But on the page you can look and you can see, is there an excursus here I want to go to or are these references I need or whatever. And it's really um, an attempt to answer a very ancient question, in fact articulated in that form by Plotinus in the 3rd century. Who are we? Because it seems to me and I'm sure Jung would agree with the importance of that question, that we've lost track of who on earth we are and what the world is out of which we come and to which we return and what our relationship with it is. So it's really an attempt to answer that. And it involves really constructing a whole philosophy of what do we know, what can we believe. So there's an enormous amount about the differences between the hemispheres and what they can show us because if they give us different accounts, we need to be able to know how to weigh them. That's part one. The second part of the book is epistemology. How do we know anything through reason, through science, through intuition, and through imagination? And I try to point out the strengths and the weaknesses of each of these and how they need to be not one trumping or excluding another, but they all work together, actually, if understood properly and under the mastership of the right hemisphere in every case, including in reason and science, towards very similar conclusions, which are also conclusions in line with ancient wisdom. And then in the third part of the book, which is metaphysics, I ask the question, so now what is the cosmos? What's its shape? I have something on the coincidentia repositorum, a very important idea in Jung, in Antidromia and so forth. Uh, on the relationship between the one and the many, and then on things like time, space, matter, consciousness. And I include values and purpose and the sense of the sacred as elements that are non-reducible elements of the cosmos. And and I have mm. to say about them in the light of everything we've learned earlier in the book. So it's an attempt to give a single, coherent, overall philosophy of life and philosophy of the cosmos. Which is why it's a longish book, and it has an enormous, enormous um, science base, so that nobody can say to me, "I don't believe you. You, you never, you know, took into account this or that." I, I did. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, um, it sounds like such an important contribution, and I am really enjoying it and look forward to getting into it more deeply. And uh, <laughs> well, we you. will, I of course. say for American readers that, that you can get it, or for anyone listening in Australia or Timbuktu, that the book depository is where you want to go. It will... It will send it to you at a very reasonable price, post-free, anywhere in the world. If Amazon haven't caught up, then tough. Uh, actually, I think Amazon owned the book depository, like everything else. For those in Europe and in the UK, you can get it from Amazon. Also, for those in the UK, you can probably get it cheapest from my website, Channel McGilchrist, but we only um, post it within the UK at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, we'll put all this in the show notes uh, also. Okay. Yes. So and, we have, um, everyone has a reference. But thank you so much. This has been a real treat. Well, thank, yes, thank, thank you very, very much. For having me along. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very nice. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.